Collective, a community of people interested in celebrating the Sabbath and pursuing God through a Hebraic worldview of the Bible. Uh, tonight we'll explore a name that has been lost in translation. The name we actually call our Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus, and why it matters. The ancient Jewish sages believed that the Aleph Bet, that is the Hebrew alphabet, which is 22 letters. Hey, Neitz, good to see you. Shabbat Shalom. Uh, are the actual building blocks of life. So what they believed was those 22 Hebrew letters were the building blocks of life. That life rests on this foundation. Uh, Hebrew letters form words and worlds. <clears throat> In the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, 3, it says, by trusting, we understand that the universe was created through a spoken word of God. And this also connects with Colossians 1, verses 16 and 17, speaking about Yeshua. It says, in connection with him were created all things. They have all been created through him and for him. He existed before all things and he holds everything together. And then John 1 14 says the word became a human being and lived with us. So we see here that words created the world. Words hold everything together. And then we see references to Yeshua being the word of Yahweh manifested on this earth in his human form. So there is a strong and mysterious connection with Hebrew letters that form words and worlds and Yeshua, which is why it's really so interesting what happened with his name. So the ancient sages related to the Aleph Bet the same way science relates to the elemental table, uh, that they are the fundamental building blocks of everything. Combined in different arrangements, these elements make things. It's also said that it is what man does to make or form something from existed material. So humans, in other words, cannot create or bara out of nothingness. Rather, we take what has already been created and we use that material to asa, which is make, or yatsar, which is mold. With the use of words to make or mold, we must take care as to the elements we use because some combinations produce life-affirming results and other combinations produce hazardous results. So I'm sure that um, Alexandra can confirm this. I don't see her on. Hey, Rebecca, great to see you. Hey, Jean, good to see you as well. Uh, but she's, she'll probably watch. But the elemental table, right? So you can take two parts of hydrogen and one part of oxygen and produce H2O or water, which is life a life-sustaining compound. We can't exist without it. However, you may take the same two parts hydrogen and combine it with one part sulfur, instead of oxygen, and that produces H2S, which is hydrogen sulfide, which is hazardous. So we can see in this example that the arrangements of the elements and their life-affirming or life-endangering power, letters and words are important. We can see this connection and how they are used together. They can also be life-sustaining or life-threatening. And tragically, cultural bias, anti-Semitism, sexism, racism has impacted our Bible translations. In its worst ways, twisting the meaning of the original intentions of the words or simply losing the meaning altogether. The power of the Hebrew language in its cultural context becomes lost in translation. But listen, thankfully, that, th that is the miraculous power of the book, right? 
that it still speaks to us even when things have worked against its meanings. I was doing some research on poets and writers and how they feel about translation, and most of them really struggle with having their work translated into other languages because they're so afraid of what will happen to the power of their words. Robert Frost wrote, poetry is what gets lost in translation. So, which is so true. We, use, we lose the art oftentimes, the subtleties, the hidden meanings. When we read our Western Bibles in English, and we, do not, and we don't recognize an idiom as an idiom. By the way, an idiom would be in English like raining cats and dogs, right? <laughs> and we teach the idiom as literal truth rather than the symbo symbolic meaning of its intention. We are changing the elements and communicating our understanding in a way that is not life-sustaining and in many ways can be life-threatening. This is why we talk about the Hebraic cultural context and the Hebraic mindset of the writers, rather than trying to force our own particular cultural meanings into the text. So tonight we'll look at the importance of a name. When you read scripture, you will notice there's a lot of verses that contain the name of a person. It also usually gives you the reason they are called that person by that name in either the same verse or sentences nearby. Adonai has a reason for inspiring this to be recorded. Hey Lupita, great to see you. Shabbat Shalom, Maureen. <coughs> and that's because names represent a person's character, their purpose, and, it, and can also represent a foretelling. So let's look at an example of this. Adam. Adam's name, the meaning of his name is man or red or ruddy. In Genesis 2, verse 7, it says, Elohim forms man, Adam, out of the dust of the ground, Adama. You can see the Hebrew words there. So check this out. Adam, the word Adam, which means man, or ruddiness, redness, dust, ground, and ground mean, is Adama, Adam is found in the word Adama. And this connection gives us insight into the relationship that man actually has with the earth. Adam was taken from the Adama, and we don't see that in English, right? When we read the text in English, we don't see that. Then in chapter 3, verse 19, we are told that because of the couple's sin, Adam will return to the Adama. So again, there is this very real relationship that man has with the ground, with the earth. The Adama, the earth, also has many of the same commandments as man. We are commanded to tithe of the fruit of the ground. We are also told to rest the land on the seventh year. In the Brit Kadasha, the New Testament, we see in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that we are a new, actually the word is renewed, creation. And then in the book of Revelation, we're told that there is also a new heaven and a new earth to come. So you can see these connections and they start way back in Genesis with the connection of Adam and Adama, man and the earth. And you only really see that in Hebrew. Uh, Ryan saying when uh, he was at the university, he saw a trend in impactful theologians. A lot of them chose to write their books in German because of its vast and highly poignant vocabulary. Yes, and even sometimes uh, I noticed that movie makers refused to have their movies dubbed. Um, similar to even black and white movies, right? They have the shadows. They feel like this with their language. They don't want it dubbed. They would rather have uh, subtitles, which is interesting. Some of the most compelling are the Hebraisms. And Hebraisms are word puns, <coughs> which is a play on words. And by the way, for fun, after tonight, 
If you want to Google Hebrew word plays, you'll see all kinds of stuff. And also, I'm going to post this, but I, uh, I downloaded some old teaching from Sabbath Collective that I did called Language Matters. And I posted it on Sabbath Collective YouTube channel. So there's two of them. So even if you want to get some more depth into the importance of language, you can you go to Sabbath Collective's YouTube channel and watch uh, last year's teaching I did on that. So 1 Samuel chapters 1 through 4, we're going to look at some word puns here, some play on words, and the importance of Hebrew. We're told on two occasions that the priest, Eli, has a weight problem. So Eli is eating too much. And he's eating too much of what belongs to the Lord, and his sons are doing the same thing. Hophni and Phinehas, they're just living a life of excess. The Lord accuses Eli and his sons of making themselves fat with the best of all the offerings of Israel. Later on, Eli dies, and the narrator tells us that Eli broke his neck when he fell backwards off the seat because he was old and heavy. And the word for heavy in Hebrew, chabed. From the same root word for honor in Hebrew, which is kabod. The story of Eli is that he has not honored the Lord, but rather honored his own physical desires. And that's what killed him. And we see those connections, kabod and kaved, in the Hebrew. And then after Eli's death, his daughter-in-law gives birth to a child that she names Ichabod, which means no glory or where is the glory. Because, as Eli's daughter-in-law states, the glory has departed from Israel. So the whole story is in these two connecting words for heavy and glory. Word plays are in almost every page of Hebrew scripture. Another one is the word ma'im, which is the Hebrew word for waters, which, as we spoke about before, is life. Ma'im is life. If you've ever been to Israel or anywhere in the Middle East, you know how much water means to them. Without it, they die. It's desert. So ma'im is found in the word for heavens, which is shamayim. And again, this connection is so beautiful because literally life-giving waters come from the heavens, the sky, and life itself comes from the heavens. So just the fact that these two words are connected, we miss in English. And they're so powerful in Hebrew. Let me give you another mind-blowing example of how important it is to know the meaning behind a particular word in Hebrew. Many who read scriptures tend to skip over the gene genealogy. Should you read that? This person begot this person begot this person begot this person. It's cool. But I just want you to know it's there for a reason. Adonai has chosen them to reveal messages. As you read Genesis 5 in the transliterated English, I'm going to get into that in a little bit, what that means, you would never be able to pick up the purpose of the names in Genesis 5. In verse 4, it reads that Adam begot Seth, who begot Enosh, who begot Kenan, who begot Mahalo, who begot Jared, who begot Enoch, who begot Methuselah, who begot Lamech, who begot Noah. In the Hebrew, each one of these names has a well-known meaning to every person who would understand Hebrew. Adam means man. Seth means appointed. Enosh means mortal. Canaan means sorrow. Mahalo means the blessed God. Jared means shall come down. Enoch means teaching, and Methuselah means his death shall bring. Lamech means the despairing, and Noah means comfort or rest. Now, I want you to see something really important here. The Lord chose to reveal these names in this particular order to tell a story, and you would only ever see it in Hebrew. And I know it's a little smaller, I'm not going to read the names, the transliterated names. They're neither in Hebrew or in English. It's a transliteration. I'm just going to read the meaning of their names. Their names are in Hebrew originally. Man appointed mortal sorrow, 
Blessed God shall come down, teaching his death shall bring the despairing comfort. Can you see that? In the lineage of these names, one right after another, we read about the fact that man appointed mortal sorrow, brought mortal sorrow into the world. But blessed God shall come down teaching, and his death shall bring the despairing comfort. <sighs> wow! Only in Hebrew can we see this. We don't pick this up in the Bugats in our English Bibles, right? Hey, Tanya, honey, great to see you. These stories cannot be understood in English or in Greek. They must be taken back to their Hebrew intention. So let's look at the name we probably use the most, Yeshua. Now, you hear me almost always use that name, Yeshua. Why don't we just say Jesus? The, well, the word Jesus is actually a transliteration, not a translation. And the difference between translation and transliteration is the difference between a comparison of meaning to a comparison of sound. So, in other words, translation attempts to give a meaning. If I translate a word for you, I'm attempting to give you the actual meaning of that word. But transliteration only helps you pronounce a word in your own language. Um, that's right, right? So I'm saying we should all be reading Hebrew. Or at least doing the research, which you can do in studylight.org or Blue Letter Bible, <coughs> where you can at least look up the Hebrew yourself. Because I don't speak fluent biblical Hebrew, but I rely upon works a lot to help me. So, again, transliteration helps you pronounce the word in your own language. It has nothing to do with the meaning. So, when we read a transliterated word, it doesn't connect to the Hebrew or even Greek meaning in any way. And on top of that, Greek and Hebrew use different al alphabets. So, let's look at uh, this name of Jesus. The name Jesus derives from the late Latin name, Isus, which transliterates the Greek name, Isus. So what we have here is a couple generations of transliterations away from the original Hebrew word, Hebrew name. The letter J, again, the Latin, Isus, translated from the Greek word, or transliterated from the Greek word, Isus, the letter J is only about three to four hundred years old. In fact, the original King James Bibles don't have the name Jesus at all. You can actually find them online and you can find them uh, in libraries. They don't have the word Jesus. They have the word Isus. So the letter J only came about later trying to interpret this E sound. It's only three to four hundred years old. So what am I saying about the name of Jesus? It's made up. It's funny that other names in Bible translations have a Hing a English translation of the Hebrew name. Like, for instance, Yosef, Yeshua's father, is translated Joseph into English. Mary, Yeshua's mother, is translated Miriam. We seem, But with Yeshua, we seem to have ended up with some sort of Latin-English version of, the, of a Greek version of the Hebrew name, for our Messiah. <laughs> That's crazy to me. So let me ask you this. What difference does it make what we call him? Well, if you are well acquainted with the, his real name and what it means, then it actually makes a big difference because we lose the meaning of his name. So when we look at his name, whoops, Yahashua, it's translated Joshua. That's the long version of his name. Uh, and that means the Lord is salvation. Yah, the Lord, is salvation. Salvation, Hashua. Yeshua is actually the common shortened version of Yahashua. So Yeshua is a version of the Lord is salvation. 
Now, the first mention, and again, I'm talking about why this is so important. Why is the name Yeshua so important? The first mention of Yeshua is actually in Genesis 49, 18. I bet you didn't know that, did you? No, because first of all, we're not reading Hebrew. We're not checking Hebrew. And second of all, we're referring to the Messiah as Jesus. But the first mention of the Messiah's name, Yeshua, is in Genesis 49, 18. It's right after a prophetic messianic section, and Jacob says, I wait for your salvation. You know what the Hebrew word for salvation is used there? Yeshua. I wait for your Yeshua, O Lord. Right in the middle of Yaakov's blessings, look it up yourself, for his sons comes this phrase. And there is not even really time to elaborate on this, but this very first verse begins the establishment of the meaning of this word Yeshua all throughout Scripture. The name that most Christians interpret as Jesus appears in the Tanakh as a form of Yeshua over 200 times. But we miss it. Because in our minds, the Savior's name is Jesus, and we're not connecting to the Hebrew language. Psalm 106.4 says, Remember me, Adonai, when you show favor to your people. Keep me in mind when you save. Yeshua is the Hebrew word used then. Keep me in mind when you Yeshua them. So to Hebrew speakers, this name Yeshua is very power, powerful. It means the Lord saves. At his birth, an angel appears to Yosef, who's his father, his guardian father, not his biological father, and he instructs him. Now, I want for us to look at something here. Hey, Sonia, so great. So great to see you, honey. <coughs> really great. Glad you joined us. Uh, let's look at something really important here. Uh, we're going to look at <coughs> the New American Standard. Again, an angel comes and instructs Yosef, the guardian father of the Messiah, and here's what he says. Now, here's what we read in Matthew 1, 21, the New American Standard Version. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, this is the verse we all know, right? So what's the Messiah's name? Jesus, right? This is what our Bibles say. Uh, we use complete Jewish version, Jean, and I'm about to read from it, but complete Jewish version, and you can find it online for free, the complete Jewish version. <coughs> and it's also under studylight.org where you can even look up the meanings there. So this is the version that we know. Let's look at the same version from the King J from the uh, complete Jewish version, the English translation of the Hebrew with Hebrew names, okay? Matthew 1, 21. Hey, Barika. <coughs> uh, Bible Gateway also has that Ryan is saying as well, the complete Jewish version. So Matthew 1, 21, using the complete Jewish version, says she will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Yeshua, which means Adonai saves, because he will save his people from their sins. You see the difference? You see the connection? Yeshua, you are to name him Yeshua, which means Adonai saves, because he will save his people from their sins. And we completely miss that in the English. And we completely miss that with the name of Jesus that we're using. Both in English and in Greek, Jesus doesn't have a lot to do with the angel's statement, does it? Will save his people from their sins. But in Hebrew, a powerful connection. Is it wrong to say Jesus? Well, if I were walking down the street and a giant snake, because I live in Florida and we got the snakes here, and sometimes they come up on you and they want to say hello. And if I was walking down the street and a big giant snake, because we have poisonous ones here too, comes sidewinding down the path, I would probably react, 
by yelling the name of Jesus. I probably wouldn't have an emotional reaction. Yeshua, I probably, because of my years of reading and saying it, would yell Jesus. And would he hear me? Sure he would. Absolutely he would. If that's what comes out naturally, fine. That's what we've been reading for however many years we've been reading our English Bibles. But let's acknowledge the fact that Jesus is not the Messiah's name. It's a name that people gave him. He knows you're talking to him, but let's try to connect to the power and the meaning of his Hebrew, of his Hebrew name. The one the angel actually told his guardian father to name him. The one that is all throughout scriptures and is connected to the Messiah, Yeshua. We're going to close this time with the lighting of the Shabbos candles. And traditionally, the mothers light the Sabbath candles, which are the candles that represent the light of peace and joy and unity. And then traditionally, she circles her hands around them three times, which is a symbolic gesture that welcomes in the Sabbath. And then she prays while she covers her eyes. And the reason traditionally why she covers her eyes is she's, she's covering her eyes from the flames, which symbolizes the ending of all work. Blessed are you, Yahweh our God, King of the universe, who has set us apart by his commandments, who has given us Yeshua the Messiah, and has sent us to be a light to the world. <clears throat> the Lord is our light and our salvation. May his light be felt in this space as the enlightenment of truth and the radiance of joy. Amen. And it is in the name of Yeshua we say, Shabbat Shalom.